Well, thank you. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here. Um, my introduction was not quite as cool. I guess I was never a captain in the Army or which I just found out for the first time here a moment ago. Uh, so before I start, just to kind of uh, say something I think is funny, is my wife for uh, 10 years now has been dying to get me to get rid of this corduroy shirt that I had. <laughs> dying, I mean, every time I turn around, the, the shirt is in the garbage, and I would pull it out and I'd wear it, and finally she got me to get rid of it. And she thought she'd won a victory, except I went out and got a corduroy sport coat. <laughs> And what's really special about this is because, you know, my kids get on the computer, they Google me, I don't do that, and they can find these talks. So I can see now in about three or four months, my wife will be at home with my kids <laughs> watching me in a corduroy coat on the internet for posterity, and she'll just, uh, she'll love it, I'm sure. So. <laughs> I just wanted to give an overview. I mean, I, I wasn't going to uh, present a lot of slides or uh, graphs or numbers. I was just going to kind of talk in a general sense about uh, management of melanoma when it, when it recurs um, and just talk about how we uh, approach patients in the clinic, talk about some of the therapies that we have to offer um, and, and, and what it's like to have these treatments and, and, and somewhat how we uh, try to pick and choose what we think are the best treatment options. Um, there's a bunch of slides I put in here um, right before I came over. So if I stare at them in a moment for a moment or two, trying to figure out what my point is, have patience. So this uh, first slide just uh, kind of illustrates a few things. And so just to back up a little bit. I can get them with this. I'll give it to the captain. And so um, just to kind of look at this, I mean, so, so one of the things that happens is people kind of ask, well, you know, I had my melanoma. It was treated. I either had radiotherapy or surgery. Um, how can it come back? What's the process there? How is that possible? So, you know, here's a picture of an eye with a melanoma. Um, and right below it is a CAT scan, which you know, you could probably say was taken within the first couple of weeks that the um, diagnosis was made. And, you know, if you look at these, what you'll know is this is a normal CAT scan of the abdomen. And, th and this is a, a picture of the liver right here. So the orientation would be that you're looking into a person's body. Uh, they're laying on a bed, so this is their back. And if they're in a bed, you're at the foot of the bed looking up into the abdomen. And this would be a, a slice through right about the middle of the body, about right here. So what you're seeing here is spine. These are ribs that come along the side. Uh, and this is the liver here. This is, and this is how it would normally look. So if I have a tumor in my eye that's treated, and you did a CAT scan of my abdomen, and there was nothing there, why would anything come back in three years, or four years, or two years? How is that possible? Um, and the question is, to be quite honest, I don't think we know, but the hypothesis of how this process kind of takes place is that these tumor cells, prior to surgery, prior to radiation, which would be uh, right here, um, behave in a way that allows them to travel. So before your tumor is ever treated, uh, there's cells in the tumor that have the capacity to, to break away, to move away. To, to, to walk away from the primary cancer spot. And they get entrance into the blood vessels, they um, circulate, um, they, and this is actually a complex process. It's not easy for these cells to do, but they get into the blood system and they can circulate, and then eventually they find their way in a foreign city, a foreign place, a foreign organ. Uh, and certain cancers will, uh, more likely than not go to certain organs. So we know that colon cancer tends to go to, to the liver. Uh, mel so melanomas of the eye do as well. Um, and so the, the thought is, is that even though you can't see it on scans, microscopically there can be cancer cells there that we won't see, that are not evident. So when you say, how can my scan look perfect, uh, and yet a tumor would come back in two or three years, the concept is, is that those cells are already there. 
they're just too small to see. You just can't see them. And, and there's no test that's going to show you this, um, at least not an imaging test. Uh, I'm sure that Yogan may have some comments on that when he gives his talk. Um, and so the, the, this next slide now shows what happens with these tumor cells. So they start here, and there's just a couple cells surrounded by normal cells, these white cells. And over time, they start to grow. They become larger. They develop a network of blood vessels. And in, in these first stages here, you probably still can't see them. But as they get bigger, they start to show up. And so this bottom scan is a CAT scan, um, which you can tell is different from the top, uh, top image. And the difference are these dark spots. Now, those dark spots are typically how a recurrent cancer would look in the um, liver. Now, this is actually not a patient with uh, melanoma, but the imaging is pretty similar. And so when we have someone who comes into our clinic with a scan that looks like this, that's when I get concerned. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about how we manage it in a moment. Um, but before I go on, I would say that when cells are in this state, when we can't see them, but we think they're there, that's really when we're targeting them for what's called an adjuvant treatment. So these are people that we want to give some sort of therapy to that's going to either kill these cancer cells, maintain them in a dormant state so they don't grow, which is just as good, um, or stimulate the um, immune system to, uh, to uh, clear these cells um, so that they never become an apparent cancer. Um, and there's a number of uh, um, agents that have been studied for this type of cancer. In most cancer types, uh, the treatments that we give to kill these microscopic cells is chemotherapy, and that's commonly used in colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer. Um, chemotherapies for melanoma, though, have not been an effective form of treatment. So these are some of the uh, adjuvant studies that are currently open. Uh, I obtained these from cl uh, clinicaltrials.gov. And so uh, the current studies that are looking at adjuvant treatment for melanoma um, are really focused on, t on um, targeted drugs or drugs that we think will uh, keep these cells in a dormant state or vaccines. Uh, the bottom trial in this red box is actually a, a clinical study that we have um, available here uh, at the uh, Cleveland Clinic. Um, now, I'll give you a second to read the title. And if you're like me, you'll say, what does that mean? Um, it's a mouthful. Uh, but this is a clinical trial, which I'll explain. Uh, one of the caveats, though, to this trial is that uh, it's only uh, open. Uh, so it's for patients with melanoma of the skin uh, and also people with melanoma of the eye. But, it, but, it, but the prerequisite to get on the trial is you, you can't have been treated with radiotherapy. It can be surgery only, uh, which is a problem and something that I uh, wanted them to change but uh, was not successful in doing so. Uh, but just to talk about the trial, because I think it's not so much this study, but the concept that is used in other studies and is even used in the metastatic setting as well, uh, gives a couple different um, types of compounds. One is something called CDX301, which is a FLT3 li um, ligand. Now, what is that? It's a growth factor. And what it does is it stimulates the body to make more dendritic cells. These are cells that are really key they're really key uh, to your body's ability to respond to a vaccine or to develop an uh, uh, immune response to um, tumors or other types of infections. Uh, prior, to getting, prior to getting that, um, or I should say after getting that, uh, you get something called CDX1401, which is a vaccine. Uh, the vaccine is uh, structured in such a way that it's targeting these dendritic cells as well. So the concept for the study, and the concept for many studies that are going on, is A, you increase the number of cells that help make and, uh, uh, or that can, uh, re, uh, can respond to a vaccine. You activate them, and then you give the vaccine. What you hope for is that the vaccine stimulates a response to the tumor that then kills these cancer cells. So when you go back to the title, it's complicated, it's messy, it's hard to figure it out. But the concept is actually pretty simple. So again, th this is a study that we have that's open. 
um, for people with eye melanoma, but it has to have been treated with surgery, not radiotherapy, which uh, is, un is un unfortunate because most patients now are treated with radiotherapy, which... Um, so what do we do, though, when we get this type of scan? I'm going to talk about the treatments in a moment, but the first things that we usually do um, is we want to know what we know. So we usually get a biopsy first, and you really have to do that because without a biopsy, you don't know what this is. You, you know, you think it's melanoma, but I've had people that have had different cancer types. I've had people um, where the statement of my fellow is, what else could it possibly be? And yet it is something else. And so you have to be diligent about that. And so I know it takes time to do it. I know uh, it's a procedure, and I know that it's very likely to show us what we think it's going to be. But the point, of, but the fact of the matter is, it's something you just have to do, because if it's something else, the treatment's drastically different. So we'll get a biopsy to confirm the diagnosis, and then the next step is to get scans of the rest of the body. Now there's different ways to do it, and there's not a perfect scan. Uh, but what we'll usually do is an MRI of the liver to define the extent of um, tumor. That's probably the best study to look at the liver itself. And then I'll get a PET CT of the rest of the body because that looks at the lungs, it looks at lymph nodes, it looks at bones. Um, and it's a very good test. Um, once we have that uh, information, uh, then we talk about treatment options. Now, um, we, we really approach the treatment in kind of with two different uh, arms. Uh, one is local treatment. So uh, when you look at patterns of recurrence for this type of cancer, um, probably 90% uh, of the time it involves the liver. 60% of the time it's liver only. So anytime you have a cancer that recurs and it's in one organ, um, it always begs the question, well, do I have to give a therapy that affects the whole body or can I give a treatment uh, like surgery or radiation um, that will just treat that specific organ? And is that adequate? And um, there's plenty of data for melanoma and plenty of data for cancers like cancer of the colon that operations on the liver, that uh, treatments that are directed at the liver and not the, not the whole body can be beneficial. You have to be careful about how you select patients for these types of treatments because they're, they're surgeries, they're operations, and if they're not going to be helpful, you don't think they're going to be helpful, you don't want to do it. Uh, but there are patients who get these treatments and they work out very well. So what I'm going to do is just talk briefly about uh, each of these um, and then uh, finish. So surgery, so here's an example. I mean, you know, I'm glad that our liver surgeon's not here right now because he'd probably say, well, technically that's not a good example. But here's an example of a CAT scan which shows basically one lesion. This is just one spot in the liver. And so this is someone who potentially, you could operate on this. Uh, you could cut this, uh, you could cut the um, tumor out. Um, surgery on the liver uh, is actually very safe uh, if done by a surgeon who's um, experienced with these types of um, operations. And the outcomes are potentially favorable. And, when, and what does that mean? That sounds really vague. It's potentially favorable. It just means that when you do this, there's a small group of people, maybe a quarter, maybe a third, uh, that do very well with this. A year later, two years later, five years down the road, they've had their surgery and they're disease free with just one surgery, no chemotherapy, nothing else. Um, that's what we hope for, and we know that we do that. The problem is, is not, not everyone is a good candidate to have um, surgery, and even if you are and you have the surgery done, there's still a risk that the tumor will show up again in six months or a year, and I think I was just talking to someone in the audience who had a similar type of um, experience where they had a surgery, and then within about a year or so, uh, the tumor was back. But this is something that can be done. I think uh, we always look at these images when we see a patient and talk with the surgeons, and really it's a multidisciplinary effort um, to try to select out patients who may benefit from surgery. If you ask me, you said, well, well, just kind of at face value, who do you think is a good candidate? Well, you know, you gotta be fit, so you have to have a five minute mile time. Um, <laughs> you know. You have to do well at the NFL combine. No, but, 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 but you've got to be fit. 
Um, and um, preferably, uh, it's better if there's been a long interval from the time of your treatment for your eye to the recurrence in the liver. If we see something come back in six months or a year, that tends to indicate the biology of the cancer is a little bit worse. Now, that's not a contraindication to surgery, but it's, it's a yellow flag. It's a caution flag. Um, it can really, should probably only be done with people with a few lesions. So three, two. Um, is there a number that we use as a cutoff? No, um, but with each number that you go up, four spots, five spots, six spots, the likelihood that that surgery is gonna be beneficial starts to really drop off. Um, and the magnitude of the surgery gets bigger. So somewhere in there, you've gotta make a judgment call. And um, you know, we, we get nervous with anything more than three spots. Um, but again, the outcomes in the right, in the right group of patients can be very uh, favorable. Uh, the next type of treatment that we think about, which, you know, again, is not an option for everyone, uh, but, but is reasonable, is a technique where you're not going to, it, it's a regional type of therapy. It's, this is not a therapy that's going to affect or work with people who have tumor in the lungs or tumor in bone or tumor in lymph nodes. But if it's in the liver, um, that this is an option. And so it's radioembolization. What does that mean? Um, it sounds like you take a radio and you turn it up and you, that's not what it is. So, so what this is, it's a catheter-based approach. And so uh, I got this right before I came in because I found myself trying to um, describe what's done and I, I couldn't really do it. So I think a picture is worth a thousand words. So it's like you're getting a cardiac catheterization. Um, they put a catheter into the artery in the leg and I suppose they can do it in the arm or other vessels, but most commonly it's the leg. The catheter is threaded up the artery, and it goes to the artery that goes to the liver. And at this point, the uh, arteries in the liver start to branch like a tree. And you can follow the arteries that go to the tumor spots that you want to treat. And you can put the catheter right there, and you can treat this tumor by depositing a resin or glass sphere uh, that's coated with a radioisotope. What you get with that then is you deposit this radioactive substance right around the tumor and you can give a very high dose of radiotherapy uh, that um, dissipates over the course of a day or so um, and, um, and only penetrates a few millimeters. So you're, you're not gonna get a lot of normal liver with this type of treatment um, and if done appropriately uh, is, is um, effective at, at least shrinking these cancers. It's probably best used in people who have liver only spread. Again, that's kind of a requirement here. Um, and probably for people who have multiple spots and aren't gonna be good candidates for a surgery. So in our kind of paradigm here, when we see people and they come in, our first thought is, is this operable? If it's not, uh, is this someone who'd be a good candidate for embolization? Um, the other uh, thing about this is that there's this thing in, in skin melanoma, and we've seen it in other cancers called the um, abscopal effect. And I will have to Google what abscopal means. I'm sure that Yogan probably knows. Um, but it, gotcha, to fly through this. So uh, the abscopal effect will be for lunch. I'll come back to that. I'll, I'm, I'm going to move on. I guess we're short on time. The limitation of this type of therapy, though, is while it will shrink the cancer cells often, we don't necessarily know that people live longer because of it, and that's a big deal. Now, now that sounds silly. If you shrink a cancer cell, if it stops growing, then people should do better. They should live longer. But there are examples in cancer care where we're able to shrink cancers, but people don't do any better than if we did something else. And so that's really important, and I think it's something that we talk about when we talk about these therapies. So chemotherapy, I think we can, we can move through pretty quickly. Um, I have a, a few stories I can say about it, but, I, but I'll, for the sake of time, I'll limit that. Um, ke uh, chemotherapy is, is very good for some cancer types. I mean, for lymphoma, for uh, cancer of the um, testicles, it's curative. Um, and in other cancers, it's, 
while it's not curative, is very active. In melanoma, both skin and eye, uh, the results with standard forms of chemotherapy are just not very good. Uh, they frequently um, don't shrink the cancers. Uh, they frequently cause a lot of side effects. Um, and it's just uh, the experience with these drugs is variable, but um, it's not the first thing that we think about when we're treating patients with this type of cancer. So targeted therapies. So targeted treatments, um, what does that mean? It sounds great. Um, it is uh, a broad base or a broad category of medicines which are designed to work based on our understanding of the biology of cancer. These are molecules that are quite small or they're antibodies and they often target key oncogenes. Um, what's an oncogene? Well, a gene is a gene that did not know it was an oncogene. It's a gene that had that made a protein that had some role in cell growth or the regulation of, of growth or some other key cell function. And that when it was mutated, when it was abnormal, drove cellular growth, drove the ability to go to other organs that became a cause for cancer. So oncogenes are not oncogenes because that's the way they were made. It just is something that happens to them. I guess the best example of a, of a targeted drug for an oncogene is for a disease called CML. And there's a therapy uh, called Gleevec that's been around now for 15 years. And this was a disease that typically people would have, uh, and they would live with it for four or five years, and then it would get worse, and they'd get very sick, and there was really not much you could do for it. When this drug came out, all of a sudden, the disease was melting away. It was disappearing, and it was lasting. It was lasting for years, and it worked in almost everybody. Um, that is, that's good therapy. I mean, that's a pill. It's something you take at home, uh, and it really works. It's meaningful. We haven't had the same degree of success with other cancer types with targeted drugs, um, uh, which I can talk about, but it's dramatically improved the outcomes in many cancer types. Um, some of the limitations are that it only often will work in a subgroup of cancers. So, uh, for example, in skin melanoma, there's drugs that target an oncogene called BRAF, but only about half of people with skin melanoma have that oncogene. Um, and in eye melanoma, no one does. Uh, in lung cancer, about 10% of people have a mutation in a gene called the EGFR, which is targetable by this drug called uh, tar uh, Tarceva, where it works wonderfully, but it really doesn't work well in anyone else. So it's one of the limitations of targeted drugs. In eye melanoma, we're starting to understand, and, and, and there's other speakers who can probably talk much more eloquently about this than I can. But we're starting to understand what some of these targets are. So uh, for example, we know that in this cancer type, there's frequently gonna be a mutation in a gene called G, called G, called GNAC. Um, and there's upregulation of genes like BAT, like BAP1 and some of these others that fundamentally drive the growth of these cells and they're key in the development of uh, eye melanomas. Um, now, what does this diagram say? There's a bunch of arrows, and I should probably explain it. The concept here is that you have this gene that when it's in an abnormal form, when it's mutated, is going to continue to do its job when it probably shouldn't, without stimulus from other sites. And it's going to continuously send a message to the next protein and to the next one and the next one in this cascade of signals that will ultimately drive cell, cell growth. Now, Knowing this, then it makes sense to target one of these proteins to try to stop that signal. And right now, we know that in skin melanoma, we target B, uh, BRAF and MEK. Um, in melanoma of the eye, there's a few studies now that are looking at a drug that inhibits MEK. Uh, there's studies that are looking at drugs that get in the way of uh, protein kinase C. Um, but again, the concept is it's an abnormal signal for growth, and you're going to give a drug that's gonna to try to block that signal. The problem is, is that if the body worked in such a straightforward way, protein A talks to protein B, talks to protein C, and it was a linear line, it was a straight line, then these drugs would work wonderfully. And the problem is, is it's not a straight line. That when you show the diagram of how these cells work, all of a sudden there's arrows going everywhere. And so 
the resistance to these medicines usually will pop up after a period of time, six months, a year, a couple years, where other pathways will be turned on, where the cancers find ways to still grow despite the presence of these drugs blocking what we thought was a key part of their uh, growth dependence. And the other type of therapy that's out there that I think has gotten quite a bit of um, press and uh, deservedly so are therapies that stimulate the um, immune system. This is actually not new. I think the, these treatments have been around in some form for quite a long time uh, with melanoma looking at treatments like interleukin-2 and interferon um, vaccine uh, treatments as well, and we've touched on that a little bit. Um, it's based on the fact that our, um, our uh, immune systems do more than just fight off uh, colds. They do more than fight off the flu. Uh, that they're constantly looking for and fighting abnormal cells, cancerous cells. And cancer cells go to great length to avoid this. And there's a, a real battle being waged between cancer cells and T cells, which are kind of the generals of the immune system. Um, and there's been a lot of progress that's been made in this field in the past several years. Uh, the, these drugs then don't actually work on cancer cells. When you get an um, immune therapy drug, and we'll talk about them in just a moment, they don't actually do anything to the cancer cells. They stimulate your body to then fight the cancer cells. Uh, what's interesting about these drugs is if you compare them to chemotherapy, if you compare them to targeted drugs, targeted drugs, chemotherapies, they typically work very quickly. I mean, we have people who are symptomatic. They, uh, they, 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 they don't feel well. They've got a pain. They've got some symptom from their cancer. And you start them on a chemotherapy or a targeted drug, and they get better within a day or so or a couple of weeks. Those drugs tend not to last. That's the problem. Immune therapies actually, while they sometimes work slowly, can be very durable. And what do I mean by durable? What's the best example of that? Some of the patients that were treated on the first studies with these drugs are living nine years later. They were told they had six months to live. And they went on an experimental treatment, and they're still alive. And there's one story of a gentleman who's had a couple kids after going on one of these, uh, one of these studies. These drugs are now uh, being used, and what we're really trying to do is increase the number of people who benefit from these drugs um, and find ways to make them work in a larger uh, percentage of people. And I'll talk about how they work and then what the drugs are, and I'm sure you know them. So this is a really complicated slide, um, but I think it's interesting. The way to think about how cells talk and then how these drugs work is in the middle you've got this pink cell. This is a T cell. And T cells are, again, kind of the key figures in mounting an immune response. Um, and like any cell in the body, they're coated with proteins. They're just coated. And it's the interaction of the kind of this coating of proteins on a T cell and interactions with other cells that kind of, that's how cells talk. That's how they figure out what they're supposed to do. How are we supposed to move? What am I supposed to do? And these interactions are really important. And for T cells, they interact with tumor cells and they interact with normal cells that try to guide them and tell them what to go after. What are your targets? What are you doing? What's your function? And so these cells are called APCs or antigen pre, uh, presenting cells. And this would be like a macrophage or a, den a, den a dendritic cell, which again, we talked a little bit about with the um, trial. These cells here go out and find tumors and then tell the T cells that's what you want to go after, and the T cells will do that. And explain that a little bit further. I've got this graph, which I was going to use last year and thought it was too complicated. So I made my own, which I think is perfect. Um, but it looks like a cartoon. I'm waiting for like Scooby-Doo to run out and eat the cancer cell. So basically, the way we break it down is if you look at a lymph node, so these are just normal structures in the human body. Uh, if you get a cold or something, you might feel that these nodes swell. So uh, you see an interaction now between a T cell that's young, it doesn't know who it's looking for, it doesn't know who to go after, and it's interacting with an APC, a cell that's gonna try to teach this T cell 
what, it, what it's looking for. And it does that by presenting this small red circle here, which is supposed to be called an antigen. This is something that, the, that this cell has found. It's saying, I want you to look at this. I think you should go after this. That signal by itself is not enough to turn the T cell on. There's positive signals that come through and negative signals that come through. If you turn this substance on called CTLA4, if you turn that on, you've effectively turned off this T cell. Likewise, when a T cell is interacting with a cancer cell and the cancer cell is showing an antigen, it's showing a little piece of itself to this T cell, and this T cell knows it's supposed to go after that. There's positive signals and negative signals that will let that interaction take place or stop it. And one of the ways that cancer cells turn T cells off is by binding to and stimulating this compound called PD-1. So CTLA-4 and PD-1 are molecules that turn T cells off. So now we have drugs that block that process. So ipilimumab, which took me about a year and a half to pronounce appropriately. Um, seriously, it's about a year and a half. Um, binds to and turns off this substance called CTLA-4. When you turn off the off switch, you turn the cell on. It works on early T cells. So this drug will come in and it will, the net effect of this drug is to turn these T cells on. These T cells then circulate and they come in contact with cancer cells and they'll go after them. Drugs like pembro pembrolizumab work on PD-1 and they turn that negative signal off. So these are three drugs now that work in different places whose net effect is to turn on a T cell and hopefully fight cancer cells. Now, do these drugs work? Um, I, I guess the short answer is that, is that they do. Um, the data is best in skin melanoma now, and there's a great data for, for that. But these drugs appear to work in lung cancer. They've been FDA approved in lung cancer. Uh, they appear to work in Hodgkin's disease. They're being studied in almost every cancer type that, 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 that's out there. In eye melanoma, we, you know, the problem is, is it's rare, so we don't have a lot of numbers, but the numbers we do have seem to suggest that these drugs work probably as well in melanoma of the eye as they do in melanoma of the skin. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at, um, if you look at the, these lines here, so this first line um, is a survival curve, and it's just, it's what you would kind of expect for someone with melanoma of the eye that recurred if you used chemotherapy or no therapy. Um, and it's not very favorable. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is many people become very sick. With the drug that blocks CTLA-4, like, ipi, like ipilimumab, what you see is that there's a tail of people that are alive three, four, and five years out. And that's at about probably 20%, maybe a little bit lower. When you use these PD-1 drugs, and they've been com um, compared head to head, um, they tend to work a little bit more frequently, so in about 30% of people. And we think that tail is going to extend out as long. And then recently, what we've seen is a combination of these two drugs is moving the line even up further. And so what we're trying to, to do by using these different drugs and by using them in, co in combination is to try to increase how high up that line goes. How many patients can we keep alive at two years, at three years, at four years? Um, that's what we're hoping for. Now, again, the data is not as good for eye melanoma, but I think what we do have, which literally I think with pembrolizumab, which um, I've started to use quite a bit, uh, the only data I've seen was presented at a recent meeting where they treated seven patients. And that's just not a lot of people. Um, I think I've treated more in my own experience here. Um, and what I've seen is what the data would show you. I give it to some people and it, and it doesn't work. And I give it to some people and it really does. What's good about some of these drugs is they don't have a lot of toxicities. The ipilimumab drug does. There's no doubt about that. That has side effects. But some of these others don't. Um, and I think that's, that's very promising. 
And then a few of the trials that are ongoing right now, I don't have the numbers for them, but they were available on clinicaltrials.gov. So combinations of drugs or drugs that are being studied for people with uh, melanoma that's recurred in the liver, uh, and uh, specifically for eye, for eye, for eye melanoma, uh, would be, again, the combination of uh, nivolumab and, and ipilimumab. We know that works in um, skin melanoma. It's being studied in eye. And so some of the um, immunotherapy drugs are there. And then targeted drugs. Again, I touched on this a little bit. I talked about the MEK inhibitor studies that are ongoing. And there's a, a number of other targets that are being looked at. Um, these studies are open at uh, just a few centers, and they tend to be pretty variable in terms of where you can find them. And then I'm going to skip over the, this study that, that, that we have here presently um, for the sake of time. And um, I guess we'll move on to our next talk, and then at the end I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.